Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, back with another video. As we talked about last time in the video focusing on the likely doomed Yuri, there are a number of suspicious threads lurking around that suggest one of the most ancient evils in the Warhammer universe is finally making his move. Today, we're going to examine some of the various details supporting this theory, along with the background of our master villain, along with what to look for in the future as Warhammer 3 continues its damned march towards release. Of course, the mysterious entity I am referring to is none other than the Harbinger, the Shadow of Terror, the Dark Master himself, Bellicor, the first Demon Prince. First, let's take a not-so-brief tour through some ancient history to set the stage. Thousands of years ago, a terrifying age was unleashed when the stellar warp gates that hovered above the world's poles collapsed in an apocalyptic implosion. Such was the devastation unleashed by this tragedy that the fabric of reality itself tore asunder, and rifts were ripped open leading to a hellish nightmare known as the Realm of Chaos. From this alternate plane of existence, foul powers that had only recently gained sentience looked upon the planet before them with envious eyes. The Dark Gods, as they would come to be known, desired nothing less than to claim all of reality, so that it might be twisted into a form more pleasing to their insane minds. To achieve this end, they sent forth countless horrors known as demons to invade the physical world and usher in the apocalypse. Known as the Great Catastrophe, or the Great Incursion, this event set into motion the greatest war that would ever take place upon that besieged world. As the custodial hosts of the Lizardmen, the mightiest empire of that ancient time, sought to hold back the tides of madness, they found themselves facing an immortal foe with endless soldiers and bizarre abilities. Despite their disciplined armies of Saurus standing millions strong, advanced technology left behind by the old ones that could annihilate thousands of demons with a searing pulse, and the godlike magical power of the Slan themselves, the Lizardmen could not defeat the Chaos Gods. Focused as they were upon a single goal, the demons of chaos were unstoppable, and slowly, inevitably, overwhelmed the cold-blooded empire one step at a time. After hundreds of years, the children of the Old Ones were nearly annihilated, and forced to retreat to their few remaining temple cities, bastions of order in a world of madness. No longer faced with a single aggressive foe upon which to focus their attention, the Dark Brothers became distracted, as is their nature, and their demonic legions fractured into various allegiances. The Demons of Chaos split to assault the Elves upon their floating isle, the Dwarfs and their underground keeps, the remaining Lizardmen sheltered within the barrier temple cities in the southern jungles, or just wandered across the world causing mayhem and madness. Yet, as the Demons started to wander across the globe, Something new occurred. Amongst the countless millions of mortal souls that cried out in terror during these early stages of the Great Incursion, there was one who saw in this madness opportunity. Although little more than a clever beast wrapped in animal hide, this human chose to embrace the carnage and beseech the burning skies to hear him. What atrocities he went on to commit have been lost to time, but such was the violence and horror unleashed by this man that the dark gods turned their gaze upon him. This black-hearted creature cried out to the deities that he could feel regarding him, offering up his soul in exchange for unimaginable power and immortality. Intrigued and delighted by this unique specimen who so impressed them, the Dark Brothers seized this cruel man and dragged him into the realm of chaos to be remade. 
with unholy power bursting from every pore in his body. The man's form was twisted and broken, before reforming into a terrifying and mighty figure. A towering monstrosity of demonic flesh and muscle. Thus was born the first demon prince, the one upon whom the dark gods bestowed the name Bellicor. At first, the gods of chaos shared their prized creation and granted him great power. This quickly proved to be an error, as the Dark Brothers are petty and selfish entities at their core, and thus soon sought to claim Bellicor as their own. War broke out between the gods and their fury, and each offered to the first demon prince the mightiest of gifts should he choose to lead their legions to victory. But Bellicor was arrogant, and believed himself far above the squabbles of the Dark Gods. The demon lord lied to his patrons, accepting all of their unholy gifts to further his own power with no intention of leading their armies in some foolish conflict. Swelling with strength, Bellicor completed his deceit by leaving the realm of chaos and emerging in the physical realm to claim it for his own. Despite this trickery, the Dark Gods held their retribution, for their greatest champion soon set about conquering the northern realms of the world. Despite his selfish ambitions, his conquests furthered the goals of his masters, and thus they turned their attentions elsewhere. Bellicor would go on to dominate most of the lands now known as the Old World, enslaving all the early humans of that territory and slaying any who dared to resist. The first demon prince demanded the worship of his subjects, and many towering edifices of horror and slaughter were built to honor the Dark Master. For hundreds of years he ruled supreme, but eventually other mortal souls attracted the attention of the Chaos Gods, and they rose many to the rank of demon prince. Never again would the gods make the mistake of unifying their power into a single champion, instead focusing solely on those who owed allegiance to them alone. With each new demon prince that emerged into existence, Bellicor could feel his well of power diminishing as the gods' favor was split between many where there had once only been one. Worse yet, these upstart ascended attempted to carve out their own domains from Bellicor's empire, which initiated an immense conflict between the favored servants of Chaos. Much to his chagrin, despite all his guile and supreme might, even the first demon prince could not claim any meaningful victory against so many immortal demigod opponents. This stalemate continued and continued to grow, each of the demonic lords summoning more and more demonic legions to bolster their forces. While this resulted in truly devastating casualties for all of the miserable mortals caught up in the conflict, it also played one of the key factors in the final fight of the Great Incursion. With every demon prince preoccupied in their free-for-all war, along with their immense hordes, they failed to heed the frantic summons of the Dark Gods when the Pantheon realized the magnitude of a certain ritual being enacted upon the Isle of Ulthuan. The first Bellicor knew of the elves' desperate ploy was when the Vortex exploded into life, draining the winds of magic from the planet and ensuring demon kind could no longer sustain themselves within the physical plane. Watching as his empire of death and madness collapsed around him, the Dark Master uttered a piercing shriek as he attempted to hold together his form. Mighty as he was, Bellicor managed to maintain his body until he was the last demon remaining upon the earth. Yet even he could not halt the inevitable, and the first demon prince could only rage as he slowly unraveled and found himself banished back to the realm of chaos. At first, Bellicor avoided the attention of his masters, choosing to lurk within the realm of chaos for thousands of years until he could take no more. Feigning repentance, he approached the Dark Gods and beseeched them to send him forth into the physical world once more. Unfortunately for him, the deities remembered his slights against them well, 
and were unified for the second time in their existence, purely in ire for their former champion. Thus did the gods strip much of Bellicor's power away from him, blasting his mind into insanity before Zinch delivered the cruelest fate of all. Since he wished to dominate reality so badly, the Changer of Ways cursed the first Demon Prince to become the Harbinger of Chaos. It would be by another's hand, not his, that the world the god so desperately desired would fall into chaos. Bellicor would be forevermore forced to act as a guide for any worthy aspirants of this deed, leading a mortal chaos champion along secret paths of shadow so they might be tested. Should the individual in question pass each trial laid before him, they would then be crowned ever chosen by Bellicor himself, the demon prince damned to set the crown of domination upon their head. Then he would live only to serve this ever chosen, acting as advisor to their conquests so that he might witness their glories and live only to serve them. Should they fail, the demon would find his grip on reality swiftly fading and be banished back into madness and shadows until another worthy champion rose again. Since that fateful day, Bellicor found himself struggling to maintain a hold on sanity, as his incorporeal form lingered on within the realm of chaos. Yet such is the power of the first demon prince that he was not entirely undone. Instead, the Harbinger made use of those brief periods in which he was summoned to fulfill his role to a new Everchosen, carefully whispering into the minds of mortals, promising them power should they manage to summon him into reality, and ever searching for a way to end his curse. Over the last few centuries, Bellicor has come alarmingly close to escaping his imprisonment. In the year 2000 on the Imperial Calendar, the Demon Prince managed to break free for a short time, by taking advantage of Chaos Cultists in the city of Mordheim after its destruction by an impacting Warpstone Meteor. Here, he possessed the body of Cardun the Gloried, a favored champion of Chaos. Under the identity of the Shadow Master, Bellicor believed himself to be finally free of his curse, only to discover he could not reach the location of the Crown of Domination while in a physical body and required considerable amounts of warpstone to sustain his form. Eventually, his new body degraded from the corruptive substance and the overwhelming power of the entity within, causing it to fall apart, and thus banishing the Harbinger back to his shadow paths once again. The next notable occurrence was when Bellicor awoke to the summoning of Azavar Kul, the twelfth ever chosen. While soaring across the skies to reach this new champion, the Shadow of Terror detected an immense power coming from the Isle of Albion, which due to various issues had its wards of concealment degraded to such an extent that the Demon Prince noticed it. After the death of Kul in 2302, Bellicor used what power he had managed to store during the Great War Against Chaos and managed to manifest himself just a little within the Citadel of Lead. Over the course of the next two centuries, he corrupted many of the Druidic Truthsayers into Dark Emissaries, and set into motion a conflict that would come to be known as the Albion Crisis. Many of the Ogham Stones are twisted in profane rituals that allow the Demon Prince to absorb the incredible might stored within the land of Albion itself, further polluting it and weakening its arcane defenses. Although in the end, Bellicor is defeated by the forces of order and his schemes to claim the crown of domination foiled, the Harbinger discovers that he has swelled with enough unholy energy to finally break free of his curse once and for all. Only a few years after this, the events of the end times are set into motion, where perhaps Bellicor's greatest scheme is about to come to fruition. Long ago, he forced the Talaian prophet Necrodoma the Insane to write a dread prophecy, revealing to the mystic the end of days by the hand of a terrifying chaos champion by the name of Archaon. 
Few know, however, that the Dark Master has utilized every ounce of his will and power over the centuries to ensure this reality comes to pass, even going so far as to father the one who will take up the mantle of Everchosen. Even this Archaon does not yet realize that while his destiny is indeed to become the Lord of Chaos Undivided, it will only be after Bellicor has completely dominated his mind and soul, thus claiming his body and the crown of domination for himself at long last. I'm sure nothing could possibly go wrong with that plan. Whew, that was quite a tale, wasn't it? So what all does this have to do with Tsarina Katarin's doomed lover? Well, remember how I said that he will probably fall to chaos and likely become a demon prince based on the hints we discussed in the last video? I think that Bellicor is going to take over his body, or at the very least, trick or corrupt Yuri into helping free the Dark Master from his curse of insubstantiality. Now, I realize you may be thinking, I thought in the long-winded history lesson of yours, Bellicor already managed to break free of his curse. Well, that's just the thing. The Albion Crisis hasn't happened yet. The Harbinger only manages to finally free himself to essentially wander at will in roughly 2521, when the Total War Warhammer series starts in roughly 2502, when Karl Franz is elected Emperor. Granted, the timeline isn't completely sacred and holy when it comes to Total War. There's a lot of shenanigans and mixing around, so that doesn't matter 100%, but at least matters 50%. They try and kind of keep it close. So, the first Demon Prince is still looking for a way to achieve his freedom, even though he has some decent tinkering going on over in Albion. So, our tinfoil hat theory for today is this. Yuri is not only going to go through all the stuff I mentioned in the last video, but I think he will also either be used to unleash Bellicor, or possibly be possessed like the old Shadow Master did within Mordheim, the City of the Damned. Especially because if we read the text at the bottom of the Steam page about the mysterious Ninth Legendary Lord, it says, The world stands on a precipice. A single push will plunge it into cataclysm. And there is one who schemes to achieve just that. An ancient figure who desires nothing less than to wield supreme power. But to succeed, he will need a champion. This, it's gotta be Balakor. It all lines up, it all makes sense, it all adds up. It's all perfectly ducks lined in a row, and I'm taking my shot. It's gotta be Bellicor. I know some people are thinking, oh, maybe it's Nagash. We can talk about that another day, but I think when you look at the context of that quote, when you're looking at someone who's trying to plunge the world into cataclysm and achieve ultimate power in that scenario, I really don't think Nagash makes any sense, because the whole thing with Nagash is he hates Cataclysm. Nagash is ordered to the point of everything is stagnant for all of eternity. He is the one sentient being in all of existence, because everything else is dead. Nagash is not someone who wants to plunge the world into chaotic Cataclysm. Bellicor, on the other hand, absolutely does. And quite frankly, Bellicor is way more ancient than Nagash is. Nagash has been around maybe three, four thousand years off the top of my head, but Bellicor has been around for well over ten thousand years. They're not even close to each other. It's it's gotta be Bellicor. Anyway, I would love to know what you think of Bellicor in general and this theory. Do you think the Dark Master is finally making his move as the Dark Gods attempt whatever the hell is going on with Kislev and Cathay? Perhaps he is the grand puppet master behind the catalyst that has thrust everything into motion. That'll pretty much be all for today. I'll be back with more videos covering news we've gotten about Total War Warhammer 3, and of course more tinfoil hat theories 
about just what the heck is going on. Till then, I hope you all stay safe, and I'll catch you next time. Real quick, before I go, I'd like to thank all my amazing patrons for their generous support of myself and the channel. Without you guys, I wouldn't be able to gather the truly absurd amount of tomes and magazines I have scattered on the floor and around my desk and everything whenever working on these theories and lore videos. I especially want to give a personal shout out to the true lords of the pyramid themselves. CJ Ubusta, Kelfatir, Sign of the Emperor, Eric, Higgins the Seagull, Eckhartier Thalion, The Heretic, and Hawk Oddly. I cannot thank you gents enough. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.